All right, class. First off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the Great Depression, basically how it started and uh, what happened, and then basically, and at the very end, uh, the incident that just made things worse for everyone. So we're going to get into that. So the objective today, we're going to analyze the events that led to the Great Depression. We're examining the effects that the Great Depression had on the whole world, and we're going to create an argument on which part of experiencing the Great Depression was the hardest. Now, here's the thing with the Great Depression. All right, it's not just one thing that happened; it's several things. Okay, there was a one thing that happened throughout, but a multitude of things, and that's what we're going to be doing. So, if it seems like as I'm explaining it, like some people in class were like, "It kind of kind of looked at looked at the faces and kind of was like, they're like." Wait, is it because of this or is it because of this? Well, it's multiple of things that caused the Great Depression. We're going to get through that, okay? So here is your warm-up picture. Um, <laughs> I love this warm-up picture. It's so funny. The first question basically asks you to analyze it and tell me what's going on here, okay? Now, the second question basically asks you to, and from your analysis of this picture what's the difference between again the animals you know on wall street and the investors in the back what's going on what's the difference between them two okay so pause the video write your response because we're moving on in three two one all right so the Great Depression, it's also known as the Crash of 29. So uh, there are some movies, some books, um, other things that, you know, they might refer to the Crash of 29. They're talking about the Great Depression. Okay. Now, in the 1920s, the U.S. economy was just booming. It was growing. From 1920 up until 1929, the nation's wealth basically doubled. Okay. This was known, this is why the era is known as the Roaring Twenties. Um, mobsters, people were making money from Prohibition, people were making money on the stock market on Wall Street. Now, the stock market, it, again, like I said, it's on Wall Street in New York, and this is a place where people go to invest their money and things like that. Now, at the time, during the 1920s, everybody put their money in the stock market. Everyone who were millionaires, all the way down to the people who were cleaning the the millionaires' um, rooms, you know, the maids and things like that. Everyone was putting their money in the stock market. Now, why? Well, because the thing is, uh, the stock market seemed to be doing really well. So people were like, hey, we should put our money in there. This is where the first red flag happens. Some people put their life savings into the stock market. So at the time, back in the 1920s, some people may have had $2,000, $5,000 saved up, and they put that into the stock market. Why? Because they figured, hey, the economy is doing well, the stock market keep rising, we'll make our money back and more. You know? And that's the thing, it happened. The, the, the market kept growing and growing and growing. Um, all the way through August 1929. But then it turned. Okay. Now, in the stock market, it's typical for it to be one of two forms, a bear or bull. Okay, And you might hear this if you watch some of those movies, especially old, old school movies. They'd be like, oh, Buffy, you know, it's such, it's such a bear. Uh, economy right now. It's just what the bull economy is just so much favorable. <laughs> you know, they talk like that kind of crap. Thing is, a bull economy, a bull market economy is a good economy. That means the numbers are rising and the economy is stable. The bear means that things are going down and stock is decreasing in value. Now, I had a student in class ask me, well, which one's, so I think it bull is better then. Yes and no. Yes and no. Okay. Because the thing is, yes, you want to be in the stock market already when the bull economy goes up. You already want to have stock in there. 
you don't want to buy stock when the bull economy is going there is already in in motion because that means the price of the stuff is going to be up here that's why a lot of people who are investing in uh, the economy they like it when there's a bear economy because that's the time to buy you want to buy cheap and sell high so like my little uh, pot figures here you know uh, like this one, I bought it, I think like eight bucks, and now it's like worth like 20 some dollars. Okay, I bought it cheap, and now I can sell it for more than I bought it for, you know, because that's how they that's how they do it when they invest. They buy low when the price is really low, and then later on when the economy gets better, the price is now high, and then they can sell it or keep on holding on to it and hope that it keeps getting higher up. Okay. So that's the difference between a bear and bull uh, market. So here's your first question. Do you think that putting your money into the stock market is a smart thing to do, or is it a risk not worth taking? Okay, so justify your logic. Now, here's the thing, too, before you pause the video. Remember the red writing. Putting your money in the stock market does not guarantee a profit. So just because you put money in doesn't mean you're going to get money out. And even if you take money out, you're going to be taxed on it because that's income money coming to you. So that's the thing. Either your money's going to stay the same, you might get some, but chances are you're probably going to lose. I hate to say it. There's no guaranteed in the stock market, not even Apple. You know, some people go, oh, well, Apple, you know, it's, it's always going to make money. Maybe not. Maybe not. Because who knows what another company might be making something brand new, something better, you know, and things like that. And then there goes their stock. Okay. So there's a writing popped on the bottom. I think that putting my extra money into the stock market is, is it a smart thing to do or is it not a worth, not worth the risk? I believe this because, and explain, okay? So pause the video, write your response, because we're moving on in three, two, one. So here's the thing. Um, factories were not doing too well, actually. The production had been in decline, and people had uh, been going out of jobs, you know? They're, they've been fired and things like that. Uh, but the problem was the stock prices stock kept going higher and higher. Typically, that's not supposed to happen. When a factory does bad, the stock price of it goes down too. Because, like, hey, they're not making money. So, hey, they're, they're going to be uh, worth less now. But the thing is, due to deregulations, um, this is what just happened with the Calvin Coolidge and things like that, they basically told companies you don't have to tell people everything you know you don't got to share all this information you know so companies didn't anytime a company does not have to do something they don't have people looking over the shoulders making sure they're doing things legally they're going to do things illegally and that's what happened here you know they they lied saying oh yeah yeah we're doing really well we're doing perfect we're we're making more product and we're selling like no one before, you know, and so the stock keeps going higher. So the stock is saying, hey, this company is worth this much, but in reality, they're probably worth this much. That's a big gap, big gap. So on top of that, there are four major problems. One, wages for the workers were getting low. So instead of getting paid a dollar an hour, now they're getting paid 60 cents, 50 cents. Um, the average citizen was in debt. Now, they may not have been like, hey, they owe this bank so much money, things like that. Some of it was even as small as, you know, at grocery stores, people would have a credit line with them. Hey, uh, I can't pay for it this week. Let me owe you uh, $5.60. I'll pay you next week. Okay. You could do that back then, back in the day. Nowadays, you can't. You can't go to a grocery store and say, hey, um, just put on my credit, you know, where's your credit card? No, 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 just no credit card. Just, just put it down on a piece of paper that I'll owe you $5, you know, I'll owe you 50 bucks next week. That's not going to work. 
it did work back in the day. Not anymore. Um, also, too, farms were struggling. There had been a big drought. You know, if you don't know, drought means there's no water. When there's no water, it's hard for plants to grow. It's hard for places like here in the valley to collect water, hold on to it. Because, again, technically, this valley is a desert. So we have no water. Things are going to dry up pretty quick, fast, in a hurry. And because there's no food, the price of whatever food there is rises up. It all goes to supply and demand. People want food. There's not enough food. So that price is going to meet what the demand. It's going to jump up. Okay. The last thing is banks had large loans that they really couldn't sell to other banks and institutions. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, how banks work. Let's say one of you guys, uh, I'm a bank and you need $500 from me. All right. So going back, uh, you, you need to borrow $500 from me. Okay. I, the bank would lend you that 500 bucks. Now let's say this other bank says, Hey, you know, how much does that person owe you? I say about 500 bucks. They would say, okay, we'll pay you the 500 bucks, maybe 600 bucks. We want to buy that loan from that, for that person. I would say, okay, sure. I made an extra 100 bucks. Now I would tell you, hey, now you got to pay that person. You pay that bank. And some banks are like that. That's all they do. They just buy loans from other banks and they just accept the money. They, I mean, because the thing is, banks like it when you pay the minimum payment because that's money coming in you're going to end up paying a lot more on a loan if you just make the minimum payments that's why they love it when you do that so they can make more and more money so they're telling them um we want to sell these loans and other banks and other institutions are like nah we don't want to buy those uh, loans so it's kind of like oh well um i guess i'll stick with it Problem is, think about like this. What if those person, the people who they lent the money to don't pay back? What's that bank going to do? Now, in the summer of 1929, consumers basically didn't spend that much. It almost came to a standstill. And a lot of companies like what we would now think of like Walmart, Target, you know, uh, you know, Walgreens, things like that. Um grocery stores they kind of were like stockpiled with items canned foods furniture um light bulbs all kinds of stuff they they have too much they had to call the production places and go like hey um stop our order for these chairs we have too many we can't sell them our warehouses are full grocery stores who had bunch of food and they didn't sell it, especially the fresh food. It it rotted, you know, because remember, fresh food doesn't last that long. So a lot of uh, grocery stores, they had to bite the bullet with this fresh food that wasn't selling. And again, because these companies, these stores stopped their orders, factories came to a slowdown. I mean, we're talking massive slowdown where they're making like a chair every five minutes now they're making a chair every hour you know they really really cut back okay now the thing is companies are slowing down uh businesses are stockpiled they're not making any sales but yet somehow some way the stock keeps going up on companies and the people who really saw the economy Really look at the whole thing. We're like, okay, no, no, this, this, this shouldn't be happening. Companies are not selling, stores are not selling, people aren't buying, people are losing their jobs, their pay is going low, but yet somehow the stock keeps going. Yeah, something's wrong here. So some people started selling their stocks. They saw the writing on the wall. They saw that trouble was coming ahead. 
you know, they weren't fall, they weren't like these other people who were like, oh my God, stock is getting higher. And the analysts say that in fall, like October, November, the stock is going to be worth even more. Again, those people who saw the writing on the wall, and they're like, no, 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 something's wrong here. So they start selling their stock, you know, little here, little there, little there, little here. Okay. And on October 24th, 1929, that's when people really realized, like, hey, wait, oh, these guys are selling. These, oh, I'm going to sell too. And then people started real, really realizing that the stock is worth, it says to, it's worth this much, but the company's value is down here. So people started trying to sell their, their shares, you know, but no one's buying it. And the value of the, of the share, the stock, starts to plummet, starts to go down and down and down. Um, people tried to sell their overshare stock. Companies, banks, investors, they're trying to sell. And this is the beginning of the crash. 12.9 million shares were sold that day, and it became known as Black Thursday. Okay? Now, um, the stock market closes at 3 o'clock. Okay? Some people over the weekend were like, oh, my God, oh, my God. What do we do? What's going to happen? What's going to happen with the stock market? Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Because again, some people still had money in stocks. So some people didn't know if hey, on Tuesday, should they sell it? Or should they wait? You know, should they wait and um, uh, maybe the stock will pick up and then, you know, things will get back to normal. All right. So here's your question number two. If you were back on October 25th, 1929, the day after Black Thursday, right? And let's say you bought $500 worth of stock, right? You still have the shares, but it's only worth like seven, eight bucks. Okay. You bought it for like 500 altogether, but now it's only worth seven or eight bucks. On Tuesday, when the stock market comes up again, would you want your broker? To sell your shares, get that seven and eight bucks, or would you want them to hold on to it and maybe see if the the market rises up a little bit, and then you maybe it might be worth be worth a couple hundred bucks, and then you can sell it later on. You know. So tell me which one would you choose and why? Would you want your broker to sell your shares right away, right when the bell rings, start selling it, or would you want them to hold on to it? Okay, so tell me which one you choose and why. Okay, so pause the video, write your response, because we're moving on in three, two, one. All right, so October 29th, this was known as Black Tuesday. Right away, right when the bell rang for the stock market, people started selling. So if you said, hey, I'd be the one selling, you basically were like everyone else. 16 million shares were traded, and this caused basically the collapse of the uh, stock market, you know, on Wall Street. Millions upon millions of shares were, were now worthless. What used to cost 20 bucks, 80 bucks a share, were now basically like one tenth of a penny. So with one penny, you can buy like 10 shares. Yeah, it was basically worthless. Um, and some investors who borrowed money to buy stock, um, they were basically completely wiped out. Some people took mortgages out of their home so they could buy more stock. Well, now that the stock is worthless and they have to pay their mortgage, they don't have the money for it. So now they lost that house to the bank. Okay. Um, and again, many people then panicked and said, oh, I need to get my money from the bank. And they bum rushed to the bank to get their money out. Here's the problem with the banking system back in the day. When you turned in money, let's say I'm a bank and you gave me a thousand dollars, right? You give it to me. I put it in my vault. And let's say a farmer says, hey, I want to borrow 
so I can buy more land, so then I can do this and this and that. So me being the bank, be like, okay, sure, here's five hundred dollars, and now here comes this panic, and you come to me saying, hey, I want my money back. I want my thousand dollars. Well, I only have five hundred dollars. I lent out the other five hundred. You'd be like, well, give me my money then. Give me, I mean, hey, I put all that money in. Give me my money. Give me all thousand dollars. Sorry, we can't give you the money, all of it. We can only give you so much. And this caused people to get frustrated, you know. Um, so another thing, too, that's why when people rob banks, those people lost their money. That money was not federally insured like it is today. Okay. So there was a panic and a problem because everyone's coming in to get their money from the banks. And the banks do not have that much money. So, yeah, things are going to get bad. So basically, people lost confidence in spending their money. They're holding on to it for dear life. No one is investing. No one is spending. The only time people spend their money is for the essential things. Um, rent, food, clothing. That's it. No other things. Um, and then factories, because of that, now basically slowed down even slower than before. Some of them just start straight firing people. They couldn't afford to pay them. I mean... Why have Joe Schmo just sitting there not making anything, you know, might as well just fire him. You're saving money. And that's what some companies did. Some companies, they just straight shut their doors. They couldn't afford um, to stay open anymore. Those people who were lucky enough to have a job saw their pay just make a nosedive. And then they saw that the price of items started to go up. You know, so apples, like you see that picture, might cost five cents today. The next day might cost 10 cents, 15 cents. Yeah. Now, some of these things that were bought on credit uh, before the crash, they were being repossessed. So people who, oh, I got this a bed and, you know, I use my credit at the store. Now the store is taking back that bed. Uh, people who bought a car, you know, on, you know, on a loan, things like that. Well, you can't pay back the loan. You know, for your payment for the car, they're going to take the car back. People who had mortgages, you know, and they can't pay their mortgage now. Now they're losing the house. Okay. And again, this was not limited limited to the United States. This was everywhere, everywhere around the world, you know. Because you have to remember, back in the day, they had this thing called the gold standard. Money was connected to gold. However much gold the country had, that's how much money they had. You know, that's how valuable their money was. So if you had a ton of gold and you only had, let's say, $30 million in printed money, you can exchange that money for a lot of gold. But if you had a lot of dollars floating around everywhere and you only have a little bit of gold, that value of that dollar was very, very small. And that's the thing. It caused a currency exchange problem and it spread throughout the entire world, especially Europe. Remember, Europe just finished the war. You know, Germany, France, Britain, um, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Germany, Italy. You know, they're they're hurting. Russia, they're hurting bad. Even before the stock market crashed and the, the Great Depression happened. Now they're hurting even more. So President Herbert Hoover and other world leaders basically try to encourage their people to be okay, up, uplift their spirits. And they told them, don't worry, this thing's going to run its course. Think it'll go away. It didn't. Um, by 1930, 4 million Americans were out of work, trying to, find, trying to find a job, but everyone's firing. No one's hiring. Okay. And then the next year, 1931, that number jumped from 4 to 6 million people. Production cut in half in this country so if you were to look around your town it would basically be like closed store open store closed store open store closed store open store okay it was really really bad the total number of homeless people it didn't matter where it was small towns or large cities homeless people were everywhere and a lot of people did not have anything to eat 
So this is where soup kitchens and bread lines happened. Now, why, I guess a student asked me, you know, a couple years ago, why soup and bread? Because the thing is, bread is actually easy to make. It doesn't take much. You just got to get some yeast, you know, some flour, things like that, and you can make bread. Bread, a couple couple pieces of bread, hey, that could fill you up, you know, dinner roll, a couple dinner rolls, and you can, you'll feel it. You'll feel pretty full. Soup is easy to make because all they would get is a neck bone from a cow, put it in the pot, put a bunch of water, cut up some vegetables like potatoes, carrots, let it sit, stew. And if they needed more, more people came in, no, no problem. Put more water. That's all these people had to eat, guys. And you see from this picture, that's these guys were starving. You know, and sometimes that's all those people ate all day. Little bowl of soup, little slice of bread. That's it. So here's your next question. You are the president of the United States and you have two advisors asking you things. They're telling you this is what you should do. The first one says for you to tell the American people the truth about how bad things are with the economy and how bad the depression is. If you do this, the people will really panic and this will cause chaos and riots in every town and major city in America and they might possibly revolt against you. The other advisors suggest for you to downplay it, reassure the people that things, hey, things are going to get better. This is only temporary. Now, if you do this, there's a large chance that this will cause even more damage to the American spirits of the people and in their faith in you and the government, and that the people will look at you as a person who not only let down the U.S. economy, but you let down the world economy, and it's going to be recorded down in the history books. Which one do you choose, and why? Now, I know you're probably thinking to yourself, God, these options suck. But that's the thing. President Her Her Herbert Hoover had these this option. You do one or the other. There is no, oh, I can do both, or this other option. No, this is basically it. So which one would you choose and why? The writing prop's on the bottom there for you. So go ahead, uh, think about it, and write your response. Okay? So pause the video. We're moving on in three, two, one. So to make matters worse, Farmers, especially those with big plots of land, those uh, plantations and things like that, um, those guys couldn't hire farmhands, you know. They couldn't hire people to go farming and pick the crops and things like that. So a lot of them were like, told their kids, hey, you got to go out there and start picking. Come on, let's go. And a lot of those kids were like, oh, I don't want to pick. Oh. Why can't you just hire some farmhands? Because, again, they're not used to actually being in the ground picking cotton, picking, uh, you know, carrots and, and potatoes and things like that. They're not used to it. The field hands were, you know. So a lot of the crops, because they had so much land, they could not pick at all. So a lot of crops just basically went bad and uh, rot in the ground. So like I was saying, in the 1920s, there was a large drought, and it continued into the 1930s, right in the middle of the country, you know, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, um, Tennessee, uh, you know, Mississippi, you know, those areas, Arkansas, those areas were in drought. Now, here's the thing. When the soil does not get water it can become kind of like sand that top layer of dirt that's called topsoil that's where all the nutrients and things are in uh in gardening and in farming so that topsoil is now basically all dried up it's basically like powders like sand and what made things worse was large heavy winds started picking up all that dirt and it created this artificial night. 
So if you look at that picture, that's not smoke. That's dirt. And yes, it did like cover the sky. It made a blanket, covered the, covered the sun. Uh, this is known as the Dust Bowl. Okay. Now, a lot of people did not do stuff like this. You know, they were just like walking through, breathing in and all that dirt. And it would actually clog up in their nose and their mouth. And they would just like take it in. Because again, dirt like that, once it tacks to moisture, like the inside of your nose, the top of your mouth, your tongue, it's going to coat that with dirt. And then the dry dirt is still going to go in your mouth, in your nose, and it gets in your lungs and it could suffocate you. And that's what happened. People died from the dust. Animals, goats, cows, sheep, you know, they were breathing in all that dirt and they choked and died on that dirt. Yeah, it was that bad. So some dirt went from all the way from Texas to the East Coast and the Atlantic Ocean. Dirt went all the way to New York. So if you look at a map of the country, imagine where Texas, Oklahoma, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, all that area right there. All that sand going all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, to New York, Boston, things like that. It's estimated that 350 million tons of soil was kicked up and covered the country. And this forced a lot of people from the middle of the country to migrate from the central part to the west coast, specifically California. Because a lot of guys were farmers, and here in the Central Valley, we got a lot of farmland. And this is where terms like oaky comes from. If you ever heard that term, um, these are people who came from Oklahoma. So that term is used, well, nowadays, because that's, that's a really, really old term. But um, that's a term that was used back in the day. So when they, when they would say, oh, this person's an Okie, that means, hey, this person's not from here. He's an Oklahoma person. He came during, uh, because of the Dust Bowl. All right, so in the fall of 1930, banking panics happened quite a bit. Uh, it happened several times in the fall of 1931, the fall of 32, and by the winter of 1933, thousands of banks just basically closed their doors because they didn't get, they weren't getting any money to pay back the people. So they basically said, um, "We're we're bankrupt. We have no more money," and they basically closed their doors. Um, banks had to sell off their loans to other banks, investors, company to get money to pay people back. But again, because no one's buying those loans, no one's buying um, whatever the banks are trying to sell. No one's buying homes. No one's buying property. No one's buying the the loans from the banks. So the banks are making money, and the banks can't get then give money to the people. Okay. Herbert Hoover tried to support those failing banks with by giving them money loans. But the thing is, a lot of them didn't. They're supposed to take the loan money and then give it to the people. But a lot of them didn't. They just kept it for themselves and said, okay, yeah, we're done. And they just walked away. So this did not help the economy at all like he planned. And if you look at that picture on the bottom, all those people you see going around the building and some of that, they are, and there's more people inside. They're trying to get their money. So here's your next question. Create your own ranking of the hardships that people went through during the Great Depression. So what do you think was harder? People losing their job and they can't get another? People basically eating like only watered down soup and a couple pieces of bread a day? Do you think that the thick blanket of dust covering for days on end, you know, do you think that was the most hardship? Or do you think the last one is banks unable to give people their money back? So which one do you think is like the worst? That's the hardest thing that people probably went through. This is the second, third, and fourth. Make the list that you personally was the hardest thing for people to go through. And the next one, next one, next one. And explain why you picked, especially that number one. Why did you pick that number one as the hardest?
Okay, so think about it, write your response, because we're moving on in three, two, one. So here's your exit ticket question. Uh, remember, you go, you can answer either the top one or the bottom one. The top one says, who do you blame for the Great Depression? Do you blame the stock market people, people who are just kept buying and buying and not giving a care if the, the number is actually true or not? They just kept inflating the balloon. Do you blame the politicians who made sure that, hey, nobody was looking over the banks, looking over the businesses back, making sure that they're not doing anything illegal, which they were? Do you blame the banks who were just, hey, uh, someone needs money? Yo, know, I'll lend you money. Because I want to make sure I get money back, you know. That's how we're making going to make our money, you know. Do you blame them for not like a, um, let's see what your plan is to do with our, your money. You know, let's see if you have any collateral. Just in case you don't pay us back, we can get at least something back and then we can sell that and make money. Or do you blame the investors and borrowers, the people who were putting money in and not knowing how the stock market worked, not realizing what the full potential is, putting their whole life savings in there, things like that. So who do you blame and why do you blame them? The second question says, what do you think it's going to take in order for our country and the world to get out of the Great Depression? What do you think is going to have to happen? Okay. So um, once you finish with this exit ticket, you are done with this lesson. Okay. So hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I do apologize for it being longer than what I thought. Um, I didn't expect it to be this long, but still, it's a very important topic. And just in case you're wondering, yes, something like this almost did happen in 2008 with the housing bubble and the whole um, banking institution basically being very, very, very greedy. And uh, yeah, they almost brought us into a even worse Great Depression than what happened in 1929. Again, that was only 2008, 14 years ago. So, yeah, something like this can't happen again. Okay. So, hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed this lesson. You guys, take care, be safe, and I'll see you guys later, okay?